parents, families, and friends, it's a true and fun pleasure to introduce Joe Roth, College of Communication, class of 1970. Joe. I'm not sure I would have done this had I known I was going to be on stage with Bill O'Reilly, but okay, it's too late. It's too late for that now, right? And I don't know about that tweeting and texting. I got to look out at you if I was seeing you down here looking at tweeting and texting. It's going to be difficult. Anyway, thank you, Dean Fiedler. And uh, congratulations to all of you for graduating this fantastic institution in 2014. This is a school if I applied to this year. Uh, I wouldn't have had a chance to get in, but okay. And students, um, let's give a round of applause to the parents who stood by you for four very expensive years. I'm sure tuition has gone up to about $2 million a year, but that's okay. Um, I had my advertising friends out in Los Angeles uh, prepare a little clip uh, uh, to show you before I started with the hopes that it might loosen me up a little bit, frankly. Okay, so let's run the clip. <laughs> Even though I'd love to see you take that bra off because it represents a team I've hated my entire life, I think you gotta keep it on. What? Asteroid, sir. What kind of damage? The end of mankind. 300,000 dead. That's not a war. That's genocide. There's a hostage situation on Alcatraz. 81 tourists. Oh, I want to tell you my secret. I see dead people. Somebody down 911! It's for you, sir. I think I cracked this. Who should I be worried? I'm getting two things pissed off and curious. That's enough chatter. do that because I refused to spoon with you last night Just a little emotional right now, okay? Y'all throwing all this stuff at me, man. But get, I mean, after this is over, could I like get a hug from you or something? Ray, how are you gonna know if anyone can throw if you keep your eyes shut all day? I can hear it. Really? Ah. That was about a 43. You saw my grandfather? Where did you see him? In heaven. Yeah, you can be the greatest, you can be the best. You can be the king Kong banging on your chest. Bingo. All together now. It's what you do right now that makes a difference. The United States government just asked us to save the world. Anybody want to say no? Yes.
I would think that guy just says bullshit. Thank you. I remember when we were making My Cousin Vinny, which that was from, it, uh, when the movie came out, it played well, pretty well across the country, but in Boston it was like Star Wars, so I thought it'd be great to... What I did was I had these guys, uh, I picked out a dozen movies I wouldn't mind seeing again, out of a full complement of about 350. And I, I hate to uh, disagree with the Dean, but only Million Dollar Arm is coming out tonight, Maleficent's coming out May 30th, so please don't go tonight to <laughs> see a movie that's not there. Well, I didn't get to sit there with you in 1970 when I graduated because there was no graduation. Well, there's two reasons. There was no graduation because there were student protests. And second of all, um, I had to graduate in August because I was a school of journalism major. And during that time, they made you take a typing test. I hope they still don't. And I had to type 30 words a minute. And clearly, I was phobic about it. And uh, I waited till August to do it. And so I can still remember sitting on a really hot classroom in Com, which was called SBC at the time. And the nice thing about it was they let you take it as many times as it took in order to get to 30 words a minute. So after about, it was like two pages. So after about the fourth time, I just said, hell with it, I'm going to memorize it and just sit there and look at it. And that was the only way I actually passed and got a diploma, but <clears throat> I couldn't have sat anyway. So this is my commencement 44 years later, so nothing else, I'm not I'm stubborn. I was kind of a shaky B student here, and I thought of myself, I think accurately, as the worst uh, student filmmaker in my class. And um, when I got the invitation to speak here, I checked the envelope to make sure that uh, it wasn't a mistake or a practical joke or a case of mistaken identity. But I'm here. One of the things that I get to do uh, right now is I get to see things that other people don't get to see. And uh, Microsoft is a partner of mine in that place called Seattle, which clearly you don't know anything about. <clears throat> And uh, I got to read one of their big marketing surveys on one of the biggest retailers in the world, which uh, I can't name, but you'll probably get it. And, uh, and it suggests that your generation thinks they will have at least three different occupations during your work life, which I think is fantastic. It also suggested very strongly that the generation you admire the least are the baby boomers. <clears throat> uh, being one myself, I tend to agree with you. <laughs> we thought we were going to change the world, and, and uh, we just kind of went along with everything else. Um, maybe that's why I constantly think of myself as 25 years old. So please, don't hold my generation against me before I start speaking. Wait till I finish. Well, we're not going to talk today about Instagram, Snapchat, or whatever great access you'll have through YouTube and Netflix and Amazon, and how social media is the big game changer. I've seen, since I've done this before, I went back and looked at some of the other speakers from other colleges, and it's all about this great, wonderful, open channel. And as Mr. Pesci would say, I think it's all bullshit. <clears throat> uh, there will always be platforms to use. It, what counts is what you bring to the table. And so, even though my nickname in Seattle is Darth Vader for the kind of speeches I make up there, I'm going to, I think in the end, they're hopeful. If I had a title of speech, it would be, if I only knew then what I know now. Because sitting where you sat, are sitting right now, looking back 44 years, I didn't know a thing. What I knew was how to go to school, how to do work, how to socialize, but I had no idea what awaited me outside of these classrooms. So I'm going to try to go through very quickly the kind of 40 years that separates me from you and show you that what the future brings 
is what you bring to it. And that the most important uh, lesson I could impart today is about failure, setbacks, things not turning out the way you want, and the amount of time it takes you to recognize it, react to it, and move forward from it. Uh, I was a, uh, I'm a big uh, believer in the philosopher Goethe's statement, whatever you think you can do or believe you can do, begin it. Action has magic, grace, and power in it. And what will the future bring? Who knows? Marriage, 50% divorce rate. Something between China and Comcast is going to taste all our lives. But the, it's just knowing how to deal with the, the setbacks that will get you through it. In my opinion, hard work trumps genius. Curiosity and recovery speed, that's what's important. Um, you must have a point of view. You know what your moral standards are, and you stick to them under whatever pressure you'll be put under. And believe me, you will be put under pressure with your moral standards. There's an absolute necessity to look failure straight in the face and learn from them. Actually, I say that I'm up here as a product of a series of failures, personal and professional, and that these are lessons, along with my innate stubbornness, is why I'm standing here today. Riding success is easy. Home Alone was a lot of fun. We were 17 for a number of weeks. Courage in the face of failure is growth and determines character. Hopefully my trip here to Boston, where I haven't been for eight years, will give you a little more confidence and preparation on how to move forward. So to set the scene for my last two years here, 1969 and 1970 were tumultuous years. The department was called SPC, not the College of Communication. I didn't even know that there was an advertising publicity and mass communications division until last night at dinner. So you'll excuse me, you 431 graduates, that I didn't know you were here. <clears throat> However, I think everything I'm saying applies to you as well as the others. Uh, I worked uh, up at uh, the library, Muber Library, in the stacks for 30 hours a week. Um, we had a deserter who we protected at Marsh Chapel. I don't know if that's still part of the urban lore here, because he was a Vietnam War deserter. There were no finals, either 1969 or 1970, because of the student protests and the bombing in Laos and Cambodia. I remember listening to the Beatles White Album. Now, I know you don't know Seattle, but you must know the Beatles, right? Okay. So I remember listening to the Beatles White Album with headphones on, looking over at the library, looking over the Charles River and watching the people rolling by. It was a pretty magical time. There were no cell phones, computers, video games, iPads, or any, any kind of social media. I was a journalism major, wanted to be a sports writer because I played sports both in high school and college. But while taking film classes, I started to get the bug. So I went over to the Orson Welles Cinema over in Cambridge, which I don't know if it still exists. I know Cambridge exists, but I don't know if the Orson Welles Cinema still exists. And I got to sit down front and notice that Groucho Marx's uh, mustache was painted on. I got to see the Battle of Algiers and uh, wanted to go down to Brattle Square and get a gun and shoot anybody with a French accent. And then with the help of uh, some select uh, hallucinogens, I sat and watched Fellini Satyricon. <laughs> and uh, I swear to you, I went in in the afternoon, and it was a nice day, and I came out in the evening, and it was dark and snowing. I'm sure it was like a part of the effect of the movie. But it got me interested. So after graduation, I went out to San Francisco with the vague idea that I was going to go to Hastings Law School. But uh, Haight-Ashbury, 1970, was way too much of a calling for me. So I lived uh, in an apartment. I was trying to think about this when writing this speech with 11 or 12 or 13 people. And frankly, I can't remember how many there were. But there was a lot of people living there. And I was too frightened to go out and look for a film job. It just didn't sink in that I would have any place in that world. So I relied on my sports background and got a job as the recreation director at the Jewish Community Center in San Francisco. 
and uh, coached some soccer, coached some basketball. And this is where I had my first brush with uh, entertainment because the woman who was the swimming instructor at the Jewish Community Center was living with a production manager for movies. So at the end of the summer, he asked me if I wanted to be his assistant. I said, why not? And so I took my mattress and go lived in their garage in Mill Valley, and I became a production assistant, a gopher, which is, in other words, you'll do anything they ask you to do for as long as they want you to do for as little money as possible. But I had a great time, and I, and I did silly things like drive stunt cars and didn't realize my life was in danger, and I just felt that, at that point that this, was, uh, this might be my calling. So I made a four-year decision in San Francisco that I was going to take or create any job that I could find. So I was a usher at a, a, a movie theater. I managed a street mime at the cannery, which is a great occupation. I ran the lights at an improv theater. I was a production assistant, ran a midnight movie program, all at the same time, so you can figure that out, hours-wise. I had no goals in mind but to learn. The money was awful, but I developed standards that stay with me today. Work hard, tell the truth, don't do anything simply for the money, enjoy the work, don't count the hours. So, let's see, the mime failed. I got fired from the movie theater. But as a PA, I got elevated to a location manager where I promptly got fired for getting an entire commercial crew lost for four hours in, in Oakland. But I learned a valuable lesson, which is I have a terrible sense of direction. And I've actually gotten lost three or four times in the last hour walking through here. But uh, the improv thing was working. Running the lights at an improv place is almost like being a director. You get to decide when they're not funny anymore. And uh, so we moved the company down to Los Angeles uh, prophetically on April Fool's Day, 1974. And uh, we got an unsecured loan of $10,000 from the Bank of America. And let's hope that person is still not running the Bank of America. And uh, we built a stage. And my job was to run the theater book the talent, do the advertising, negotiate with agents, run the kitchen, and of course run the lights. I worked from 9 in the morning until 2 in the morning, until 2 in the morning, and lived on $75 a week. It was a very lonely time. While we lost money every week on the verge of bankruptcy, one of the comics, who by the way is now Senator Al Franken, go figure, suggested to the improv in New York they buy our place. They did. We paid back the bank, barely, but escaped that colossal failure. Grace and kindness towards talent, regardless of our failure, resulted in good things happening. It's one of the things that I really learned from that experience, that when Andy Kaufman or Chevy Chase or any of these other neurotic comedians would come in and to be kind to them and good to them and understand the, what they're going through um, has stayed with me, obviously, all the way through my career. So the improv on Melrose was born, and it still thrives. But that was just the beginning of the setbacks. A CBS executive came in to see me, and he said he wanted to do, I don't even know if the word exists anymore, a multimedia show where we would tape live comedy bits with our comedians and put them on screens above the theater. And, uh, and then they would also perform live underneath the screens. So he asked me to produce, and of course I said yes. Yes is the number one word in my category, yes. So we, we taped all the comics, and um, we had a one-hour tape, which I thought was very funny. So in the middle of it, I got this brainstorm that I was going to call up Henry Close, who was one of the founders of KLH, which I don't know if it's still there, but it was over the river in Cambridge. And they had just invented the Advent, movie screen, uh, Advent TV screen, which was the first widescreen TV. So the idea I had, which was before Saturday Night Live and before cable television, uh, was that we would do an hour uh, show every month 
and Mitchell Close would give us six or seven hundred of his monitors to put in college bars across the country. So kind of a precursor to cable TV. So I called him up, I explained my idea. He said, stupid idea, kid, I don't need you, and he hung up on me, period, end of idea. So now we're sitting here with an hour tape that we don't know what to do with. So of course, my partner worked at the CBS, so we very nicely went in and transferred the tape to film, and then we used CBS equipment to go out and shoot two 20-hour movie days, and thus we had a film. Uh, I showed it to all the, st the studios, and they, of course, all rejected it. And actually, at the screening I did for Warner Brothers, the acquisitions guy accused me of putting people in the theater to laugh because he didn't think the movie was funny. So finally, on this weird journey, uh, I'm not sure how, but we got a gentleman from Dallas who was an exhibitor of pornography to pick up our movie, a comedy. And uh, the movie was called Tunnel Vision. We made it for $33,000. It grossed $20 million, and I became a movie producer. <clears throat> CBS was not happy <laughs> with their unknown contribution to the film. They tried to stop its release, but settled on firing the executive and escorting him out of the building. So I think you're getting the idea that you have to put yourself out on a limb a little bit sometimes to make things work. So failure in the initial idea was just a midpoint to success. Setbacks are only that. Unorthodox thinking can change the results. I always tell the people I work with that, that no is the answer you get halfway to yes. Soon after that, another huge failure taught me that the powers that be, the very highest people in this uh, prism that I couldn't seem to break into, that they expected things not to work. And as long as they believed in your work ethic and your talent, that you weren't doomed. In 1980, I put together a local LA workshop to, sit, to aim to turn a Broadway musical called Gangs. And there was a show in New York called Runaways at the time, it was all the things. So we put together a 10-minute presentation. We hired unknowns. We had all the studios come into this little glass room where they all had to look at each other, which was fun. And uh, everybody wanted it. And I still remember being dragged out onto Hollywood Boulevard against an old musty Ford uh, station wagon where Barry Diller and Michael Eisner, who were running Paramount at the time, basically one tooed me into selling it to them, which I did. But not trusting me, they hired David Merrick, who was the dean of Broadway at the time, to oh, quote unquote oversee me. So we spent a year trying to extend this little 10 minute thing, where which had no story into a full-length show. So uh, in August, I thought we were ready, and uh, we rented a tiny little theater, the Pilot Theater in Santa Monica, in, no, in, on Santa Monica Boulevard in West Hollywood. It was about 105 degrees in the theater. I was gonna show it to Paramount and David Merrick. Uh, the, our lead singer lost his voice that day. It was unbearably hot. But you know what? The show stunk. <laughs> it could have been 60 degrees in, on Broadway. The show was awful, awful. Everybody walked out without a comment. That was the last I saw of Diller and Eisner, right? It was dead. Nobody even had to call me and tell me it was dead. It was dead. So what's interesting is uh, eight years after that awesome presentation, without any further contact with Barry Diller, he hired me as chairman of 20th Century Fox. Six years after that, without any further contact with Michael Eisner, he hired me as chairman of the Walt Disney Studios. So these guys either forgot that night, which I certainly haven't, or, or ignored it. So you're gonna meet bosses who act like they don't need you. And this is one of the things that I'd really like you to think, think through, because I have, obviously I'm on this side of the coin now. It's not true. We do need you. We need you to be smart and creative so we can keep our jobs. That's it. It's not out of altruism. It's the nature of life, right? We need you to be good. I hired, I did one of these uh, uh, graduate seminars at, uh, it wasn't graduate, it was just a graduate program at USC. 
And this one guy kept annoying me throughout the entire time. He was so smart and ambitious. Afterwards, he cornered me in the elevator, and I hired him, and now he's the president of MGM. So again, you're, somebody's always watching. Somebody is always looking over what you're doing, even though you think you're working in total anonymity. And even though you think it's all about the results, it's not about the results at all. It's about the journey. And you've got to enjoy the journey. You've got no control over the results. I have no idea if anybody's going to show up for a million dollar arm. I loved making the movie. I have no idea if anybody's going to show up for Maleficent. It was a terrific three year experience. All you can do is work hard and put yourself out there. Bring yourself to the table. I got married in 1980, and uh, three years later, our daughter Alexis died of sudden infant death syndrome at 18 months. It was the unimaginable worst time of my life. The pain never really goes away. It just gets dollars spiking around her birthday and date of passing. But after months of mourning, we carried on, and sitting right up there, are my four beautiful, healthy children, Zach, a BU graduate of 2006, Julia, David, and Robert. Why don't you guys stand up? <laughs> the reason I mention this horrible event on such a sweet and wonderful day is because you never know the curve that life is going to throw you. And for me, it took months of uh, mourning and getting myself back in. I said, you know what, I just got to go on. And uh, I threw myself back into producing a blues bachelor party with Tom Hanks, which became a hit. And Fox gave me my first production deal at the age of 36. And then he met a Subaru dealer who fancied himself a movie producer. And he became my financial backer. And we started Morgan Creek. And in two years, we produced 10 movies including Young Guns, Major League, and for you horror fans, the David Cronenberg classic, Dead Ringers. I thought I was working in obscurity. I was working in the back of 20th Century Fox lot, in one of those dilapidated little uh, uh, makeup rooms with an assistant. So you can imagine my shock when Rupert Murdoch asked to see me at his house. So I went into his house, which is up on top of a high hill you can well imagine and uh, walked in, sat there, looked at the fireplace, which was taller than I was. <clears throat> and he walks down with Barry Diller. And they were s interested as to how I was producing five movies a year with an assistant for them when they had a staff of 3,200 and they were making four or five movies themselves. I explained it as best I could. The interview was, which it turned out to be, was 15 minutes long. I walked away amused. And uh, the next morning, Barrett Diller called me up and said, uh, you're the new chairman of 20th Century Fox. It was my first weekly paycheck at the age of 39. I told him he was making a mistake, but he didn't want to listen. Now, I got lucky. Luck is always a good part of it. You got to be there to get the luck, but luck is a good part of it because Murdoch and Diller were just starting uh, Fox Network. So they were going to leave me alone as long as I didn't kill somebody. So Fox was a blast, a full company to support my ideas. Um, I had friendships from there that have lasted the 20 years and, and still exist. And we went out, we made White Men Can't Jump and Last of the Mohegans and Die Hard too, and Sleeping with the Enemy, My Cousin Vinny, a little comedy that fell into my lap called Home Alone. And for you advertising people, you know, looking at that clip, I was just thinking about this. Um, Obviously, my uh, strength is in story and marketing, and I won't start a story until I know how to market it. And, I won't, and, and if, in fact, the story comes in and it's different than what I thought it was going to be, I'm going to still market it the way I thought of it, because that's what gave me the confidence to do it. So Michael Mann, who is a fantastic and difficult filmmaker, uh, we made Last of the Mohegans down in North Carolina, and he went trillions of dollars over budget, and it was great scope, and a wonderful movie. And when it came time to marketing it, we just couldn't find a handle. And then the handle was, was of course, Daniel Day-Lewis and Madeline Stowe. Uh, Daniel saying uh, something to the effect of, uh, stay alive no matter what, I'll find you. 
We could have shot that in my shower. But anyway, it became the signature of that movie. So for me, my job before saying yes to a movie, uh, green light on film, getting involved in a script, is I have to feel at the end of reading this thing, how am I going to get people into the theater Friday night and how am I going to get them to feel something? Not know something, feel something. Because what drags people out in this world where there's an awful lot of choices is, oh yeah, if I go see that, I'm going to laugh. Oh yeah, if I see that, I'm going to go cry. Oh yeah, if I see that, I'm going to be awed and, uh, and mystified. But it's, it's, it's less the uh, content uh, and more of the, what the content makes you feel. And people are very, very good at knowing when you're authentic and when you're fake. And when you go into an interview and you come in and see somebody, they're going to, right away, they don't have time to suss out, you know, were you an ice skater in high school? They want to know, are you authentic or are you fake? So um, I moved over to Disney, take a much broader role. I uh, ended up running the movie, television, home entertainment, New York stage, music, and something, I don't know. Anything wasn't bolted down. And um, really, I just think of myself as a movie producer. Um, so one of the jobs I had at Disney was to oversee Pixar, which is fantastic. I spent six years up going up to Pixar, and uh, I was there from Toy Story to the sale of the company to Disney for seven and a half billion dollars. And uh, so I spent 12 years, six years working for Disney and then six years on the board with Steve Jobs. Another job I had there was uh, supervising Miramax. So I got, to get, I got to know Harvey Weinstein really well, who, good for him, is still relevant. So here you go, Murdoch, Diller, Eisner, Jobs, Weinstein. All very different, but have strong, similar qualities. Smart, driven, authentic, competitive, tough, imaginative, with excuse the phrase, big balls. Not afraid to fail, but expecting it as part of the process. Big risk takers who ignore their critics. But I have to tell you something. Um, I coached my son's soccer team throughout the entire run of my Fox and Disney days so that I was missing from Friday after lunch until dinner time, and then I was missing again on Saturday for a game. And so I had to go tell that to Murdoch, Diller, and Eisner. And because I felt like it was an appropriate thing to do in my life and something I wanted to do, I guess it, it didn't ring as fear. And I just said matter-of-factly to these gentlemen, you know what, you got me Monday through Sunday, anytime, day or night, but I'll be missing Friday afternoon and Saturday sometime because I'm going to coach my son's soccer team. And these guys who have well-earned reputation as being tough guys, nobody, these are three separate conversations. Nobody ever said a word to me. Nobody ever said, oh, that's ridiculous, or can you spare that time? And even if they said something behind my back, I never even heard about it. It just seemed like this is who I am. This is what you get. I'm going to work my ass off for you. I'm also going to do this thing. So in 2000, I wanted to go back and be more entrepreneurial. I started Revolution Studios and, and as usual, ran into a maelstrom of difficulties. A painful divorce, a total paradigm shift toward tent poles like Spider-Man and Godzilla and uh, whatever, you know, all these Marvel movies uh, started coming out. And we weren't financed for that. I directed three movies at the time I was running the company, which was also probably not that smart of an idea. And uh, the DVD market, which was representing 40% of our revenue, collapsed. So, but like the improv, I knew it was important to keep the doors open, even though we didn't, had lost our movie financing. So we took two of our TV shows, Are We There Yet? and Anger Management, and turned them into 100 episode television shows, which were highly profitable. And then we licensed 
the 46 picture library to Netflix. So that saved us from bankruptcy. And revolution carries on. So you must remember, life is nothing but curveballs, real curveballs, and your ability to change and your reaction time to failure can turn a bad hand to a playable one. But I feel the same way. <laughs> but now it's 2007, and I've completely lost my confidence. Revolution's not working. I don't know where I am. I don't run a studio anymore. I got to go pitch stories to somebody who worked for somebody who worked for somebody who worked for somebody who worked for somebody, who worked for somebody to me. It was just, I really was lost. And so I convinced myself that I had failed both personally and professionally and was no longer relevant. So on a whim, I went back to my hold card. I tried my hand at starting a sports team. I started the Seattle Sounders Football Club. I realized it had the same fundamentals as movies, getting people to come out of the house in a competitive entertainment environment. We applied the same principles, work hard, create a brand, create a democratic, fan-friendly environment, hire the best people. It worked. The Sounders averaged 45,000 fans a game. That's more than twice that of any American soccer team, and it's more than any American baseball team. More importantly, we've become an important part of the culture of Seattle. Most importantly to me, it served to get my confidence back. Working with a staff of four, we have produced six movies independently over the past five years. Alice in Wonderland, which grossed over a billion dollars, Snow White and the Huntsman, Oz, the Great and Powerful, Heaven is for Real, Million Dollar Arm, and Maleficent. There's not a Geely amongst them. And yes, I produced Geely and survived that too. <laughs> there would never be anything called Benefer if it weren't for me. <clears throat> Interesting story there, just as an aside. It was actually supposed to be Ben Affleck and um, Halle Berry. And during rehearsals, my brilliant director convinced me that Halle Berry wasn't right for the part. So I had the great honor of firing this most beautiful woman to her face and promised her that I'd get her another movie, which I did. And now I was looking for a favor, because we were about to start, and we had done Made in Manhattan, which was a big hit movie, and I knew Jennifer Lopez from that. And called her and she said, sure, I never met this guy, but uh, I'll do the movie with him. <clears throat> About a week in, I saw trouble. And uh, it only went from there. We never had a chance. But you know what? Ben Affleck survived that, I think, pretty well. Jennifer Lopez survived that, I think, pretty well. And yes, I'm standing here. So now as I approach my 66th birthday, I'm wondering what comes next. I would be remiss in not speaking about the man I met here at the university with the greatest impact on me. I'm not much of a hero worshiper, but Professor Howard Zinn was certainly a hero and role model for me. It's kind of the antidote to Bill O'Reilly for me. His courage and willingness to express himself, no matter how unpopular his views, became a notion for me to emulate and never give up on. And I've noticed that his views that were so, quote unquote, radical 40 or 50 years ago, don't seem so much anymore. Interesting. He was truly a great man, and I hope his writings and teachings still re remain a valuable part of Boston University. Lastly, I'd say seeking perfection in anything is deadly and guarantees disappointment, whether it's a job, a friend, or a partner. Nothing will be perfect. Grace and courage under fire, valuing relationships, sticking to your moral code, ignoring the naysayers, bouncing back and depersonalizing setbacks, and understanding magic can only happen with action. That's what matters. You are not, you are not charged with changing the world. Now, I saw a bunch of these kinds of things. I've never done one. And that became like a current theme. I totally disagree. You are not charged with changing the world. You are not going to stop those polar ice caps from melting 200 years from now. What you are charged with is making your own valuable contribution to humanity. Celebrate life and love. The world is not nearly as scary a place as you think, as I can attest to. 
Thank you for letting me share this experience with you, and I hope it gives you some measure of confidence. I hope it wasn't too Darth Vader-esque. Uh, remember, without failure, setbacks, disappointment, and pain, there is no growth, and the only fatal thing is not trying. So if a working class kid from Lower Manhattan, who is supposed to be a gym teacher, yours truly, can be giving a commencement speech to celebrate the 100th year of this fantastic university, then anything is possible. So as they say, it's on you. Good luck to you, and thank you again. Looks like, a, looks like a soccer jersey. This is it. This is, it. Uh, this is the soccer jersey from uh, the soccer team here at BU for Joe, as you can see. For the class of 2014. Joe, thank you. Thank you. I'm now one of you.